Gabriel Sherman, congratulations on your new book. It's generating a lot of interest. Um, it was particularly interesting to me as a person who covered the news media, including Fox, for many years in New York, and also because I was on a Fox News program about the media mm -hmm. some years back. So I want to ask you, first of all, what attracted you to writing a book about Roger Ailes? Well, that's a great question. Thanks for having me. You know, I have um, covered media for a decade now, and I have been fascinated by the intersection of media and politics. I've covered the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC. And I wanted to do a book about the history of Fox News because the network really revolutionized cable news. It was the most dominant cable news network. Its ratings were double that of CNN and MSNBC. And very early into the reporting of that book, I realized the way to tell that story is through the life and career of Roger Ailes because Fox is a complete expression of his worldview. The network is shaped in his image. And without Roger Ailes' unique talents, I don't think Fox would be the success that it is. So it really de evolved and developed into a portrait of Ailes with Fox News as the culmination of everything he had worked towards, both in politics and show business and television. You've said that Fox News is a, quote, political operation that hires journalists. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you mean by that? That's, um, of course, you know, it, it goes back to Roger Ailes. You know, Roger Ailes is a political person. You know, he, um, you know, he got his start in television, but he really owes his career to his work as a Republican political strategist and a, a campaign advisor to Republicans like Mitch McConnell, Phil Graham, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, and most famously Richard Nixon, who he worked for in 1968. And Ailes really thrived in the culture of political campaigns. You know, secrecy is paramount, driving, you know, ferocious competitiveness, all the things that we associate with Fox News is, is, is tied to Roger Ailes' career background. And so when he came to Fox in 1996 and he started the network for Rupert Murdoch, he brought all of that culture, the DNA of a political campaign. You know, I write in the book how he structured it like a political campaign. There is, in fact, a group of executives, some of his senior most team, that call themselves the G8. And that is a reference to the G6, which was a group of uh, campaign advisors who worked for George H.W. Bush in 1988. Um, and so you see all these, these little, these little say, uh, phrases and sayings that come from the culture of political campaigns that, hap that, that occur at Fox. But more than that, the way the network operates is really much on the structure of a political campaign. It starts with the 8 a.m. meeting with Roger Ailes' news meeting. Everyone marches in lockstep. There is a sense of mission and purpose that flows from the top. And you really see all of those attributes that come out of the political world. Well, tell me some specifics. How do you see on the air, what you see is a reflection of, of Roger Ailes dictating this agenda and mm -hmm. it's being a Republican agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, what you see at Fox that is so uh, so unique and so much better in terms of television. Uh, it's than very uh, well produced. Yes, yeah, it's even very well. His, even his detractors would exactly. say that. Exactly, I mean, Ailes is a television genius, his eye for color, timing, uh, picking talent, you know, picking talent that speaks authentically through the screen is really a testament to Ailes' talents. But what the way it manifests itself is that Fox drives these narratives, these storylines that, that really come out of the political world. You know, in 2008 with the rise of, uh, of Barack Obama, you, see, you saw Fox pursue these storylines uh, through the first term of his presidency. Like the, what? Um, Obama's czars was a big storyline. This idea that the administration was appointing uh, policy advisors that had almost extra constitutional authority. Uh, you saw the, the health care debate was a huge story. You know, I, I write in the book how Roger Ailes gave a prop to a health care pundit who could go on camera and make the point that this bill was too unwieldy. He literally gave uh, an on-air talking head a stack of papers that was about this tall that, that she could wave on, on screen to make that point. And you see that scripting, that sort of sense of narrative message that comes out of the political world that you see it in the programming. Well, you know, Fox usually says when it's criticized, we have Democrats on, mm -hmm. we have Dennis Kucinich, yep. uh, a liberal on. Uh, what is your response mm -hmm. to that? That's How good, is it yeah. so unilateral if they, they have some well, I think other that's, people that's on? That's a great point. And the, the notion, the critique that has been leveled against Fox that it's a Republican network uh, does not mean they can't have liberal voices on Fox. I mean, they're separate issues. And in fact, it's a testament to Ailes, it's a testament to his, his talent that he curates the, uh, the people who appear on his network so that there is a mix of voices so that you have liberals feeding red meat to the conservatives. It's never really a fair fight. I mean, no anyone who watched Hannity and Combs 
would never consider Hannity and Combs an actual equal exchange of left and right ideas. And in fact, in the book, I describe how Hannity's producers actually created this elaborate ruse to keep Combs on board and make Combs, uh, Alan Combs feel like a, an equal partner in the show, when in fact, Sean Hannity was the de facto executive producer of the show. Sean Hannity would pick the talking points, the, the topics that they would cover, and then the producers would go to Alan Combs and say, okay, Alan, what, what is your feedback? But really, the whole, the whole show, the structure of the show was dictated by Sean Hannity. So what Ailes has done is that he's sort of stacked the deck so that conservatives always win while allowing himself to have uh, some liberals on there to give him that talking point to say, listen, we give both sides. Well, what do you make of the fact that people say well, they have good journalists mm -hmm. in their Washington bureau? Yep. Not everyone maybe fits this, the, the storyline that yep. you have set out here. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it, it goes back to Ailes's genius as a, a political messenger. And I think I want to step back a second and talk about his work on behalf of Richard Nixon in 1968, which will help people understand uh, why Fox uh, can still be a political organization while having liberals and reporters on its payroll. And so let's go back in time. In 1968, Roger Ailes was a young television advisor to Richard Nixon. Ailes had come out of the world of daytime TV. He had been the executive producer of The Mike Douglas Show. He talked his way onto the Richard Nixon campaign by convincing Nixon that he needed to master television. And so Ailes goes to work for Nixon. And how did Nixon uh, structure his campaign? Well, they traveled the country doing these town hall events that Roger Ailes called the man in the arena. And they were these staged events where Nixon would appear in front of a group of panelists that were just regular citizens that the Nixon campaign handpicked. And Nixon would answer questions from the panelists, and the audience would be local Republican supporters cheering wildly for the candidate. So the entire event was staged to make Nixon look uh, courageous, that he was facing questions from hostile panelists, when in fact the staging, the lighting, the audience, everything was put in place to make Nixon excel. Now let's go for fast forward in time. Fox News, right? If you have Roger Ailes who wants to communicate a Republican political message to advance his party's interests, he knows that if you just feed right-wing talking points to the audience, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be authentic. So what it, he applied the same techniques that the Nixon campaign did by, by handpicking the audience, having people that confer credibility, that are hostile potentially to his message, and, th and that tension, that exchange of ideas confers a level of credibility on Fox, the same way Nixon was able to confer credibility on its campaign by picking by having panelists that would ask tough questions. You know, Ailes famously in the 1968 campaign thought that the best panel, the best town hall Nixon did was the toughest, was where he had to sweat and face tough questions because the audience wanted to see him fight. And it's the same thing at Fox. Ailes knows that the audience wants to see Republicans have to fight for their side. And then ultimately, when they win, it's even that much more effective. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh they have hit that pretty hard mm -hmm. because they have a pretty combative uh, public relations of Again, uh, apparatus. Part, of, part of the culture of a political campaign. Right, but they have said you didn't talk to Roger Ailes mm -hmm. and you didn't check the facts with him. And you have a lot of anonymous sources mm -hmm. in the book along with a lot of other sources. Yeah, on the record sources. And you have a few, some of the inc most incendiary comments you attribute to him are to, uh, attributed to mm -hmm. a source who's familiar mm -hmm. with the situation. Tell me about how you respond to their saying, well, you didn't get our guy, you mm -hmm. didn't fact check with us. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you stand on that? Mm -hmm. Well, two things. Um, the book was fact checked. Um, I had a team of two professional fact checkers who spent more than 2,000 hours vetting every word in the manuscript. But now, who were you fact checking with? Well, so now, just going back to Roger Ailes, I reached out to him more than a dozen times, both in person and in writing. I traveled to different states to see him in person uh, where he was giving speeches at public events. Uh, I wrote to his attorneys. I wrote to his public relations advisors. I, I would sit down and discuss every single fact with him in the book, and he declined every single request to participate so in the book. So how did you ascertain the truth of what you said mm -hmm. if you weren't checking it? Well, so the book was vetted. We discussed, uh, we talked to sources who I interviewed. We checked the secondary sources. We checked documentary records. And ultimately, as I say in the end notes, I feel very confident of the veracity of the reporting. And it's important to point out that the book has been out now, and all of the revelations in the book have been out, and Fox News has not challenged one single point well, in the book. Well, a couple that they've challenged. Mm -hmm. They challenged the one about whether he made an anti-Semitic remark, mm -hmm. and the fellow who's mm -hmm. allegedly reported. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really want to go into mm -hmm. all of that yeah, detail, sure. but 
he has denied something. The fellow yeah. of whom he was supposed to have said it has denied yeah. it. So it's not true that they haven't tried to. Well, do that. they've tried to.